Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 36 of Advanced Linear Algebra. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about what the singular value decomposition tells us about the four fundamental subspaces of a matrix. So the range of a matrix, the null space of a matrix, and the range and null space of its conjugate transpose or its adjoint. Okay, so the setup here is think back to this example that we had at the end of the previous lecture. We had this three by three matrix, we computed its singular value decomposition, and then we talked about it geometrically. And we said that sort of the singular value decomposition, it tells us that it turns this unit sphere here into this two dimensional ellipse living in three dimensional space. Okay, well, you can think about this as corresponding to the fact that the matrix its range is two dimensional, right? Remember the range is a set of all output vectors. So the range of this matrix, while well, it's this ellipse, it's the span of this ellipse actually. It's the entire plane going in the direction of this ellipse, whatever plane that ellipse lives on, that's the range of the matrix. Okay? In other words, it corresponds to the fact that the matrix has rank two. Okay, so the fact that there are just two non-zero singular values here, right? The sigma one told me the longest uh, axis length, and then sigma two told me the shortest axis length. The fact that there are just two non-zero singular values, that corresponds to the fact that the matrix has rank two, and that's true in general. However many non-zero singular values you have, that's gonna be the rank of the matrix. Okay, so the singular values, they tell you how big the range is, basically. Well, if you go one step further and you actually look at the singular vectors as well, in other words, the columns of the unitary matrices U and V in the singular value decomposition, those tell you not just how big the range is, but also where it's pointing. Okay, so here's sort of the setup here. For this previous example, still three by three matrix that we were talking about, if we look at the first two columns of the unitary matrix U, so if we look at, we'll call them U1 and U2. Okay. Well, it turns out those, those are the vectors that point in these directions here. U1, it's a unit vector pointing down in this direction here, and U2 is a unit vector pointing in that direction. Okay, if we do a little computation here, what we're going to see is that, well, similarly, the third right singular vector, so in other words, the third column of V, so we're, we'll call that V3, well, let's just do a little computation here, and we're going to show that V3, it's got to be in the null space of the matrix. So there's a lot of connections with the fundamental matrix subspaces going on here. So if I compute AV3, what's gonna happen is, okay, I just plug in the, the singular value decomposition for A there, okay, and that's U sigma V star times V3, okay? And then we're just gonna do a neat little matrix multiplication trick here, V star times V3, well, if V3 is the third column of V and V is a unitary matrix, what happens here, if you remember that the way the matrix multiplication works, right, it's you're doing dot products of rows of this matrix with this column. So I'm doing like the first row of V star dotted with V3. Well, I mean, the rows of V star are the columns of V. Okay, so I'm doing the first column V1 dotted with V3, but those are orthogonal to each other because they're columns of the unitary matrix. Okay, so the first entry of this product here is gonna be zero. Similarly for the second entry, it's gonna be V2 dotted with V3. So that'll get me a zero in the second entry of this product. But then in the third and final entry of this product, I'll just get one because it's gonna be V3 dotted with V3. So I end up getting the column vector E3 when I do this matrix vector product over here because I get zero, zero, one. Oh, that's the third standard basis vector, E3. Okay, so that's just a little weird matrix multiplication trick. And then from here, I just remember that, hey, sigma is diagonal. So if I do this matrix vector product, it's diagonal matrix times E3, well, I just pick up the third diagonal entry out of sigma, okay? So I get what we call sigma three, the third singular value. But I mean, in this example, it's a three by three matrix, it's third singular value was zero. So this is just zero times E3 and the entire product just becomes zero after that point, okay? So in particular, V3 here, if A times V3 equals the zero vector, that means that V3 is in the null space of A. Okay, so all of this is just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on here, okay? The columns of U tell you something about the range of the matrix and the columns of V tell you something about the null space of a matrix. Well, let's pin this down a little bit more precisely now. Let's show an actual theorem that tells us how all of this works. So here's the setup. Suppose you've got some matrix, doesn't even have to be square, singular value decomposition stuff works for rectangular matrices too. Suppose it's got rank R and some singular value decomposition, U sigma U, V star, okay? Where U and V are unitary matrices, sigma is diagonal, okay? Let's give names furthermore to the columns of the unitary matrices U and V, okay? So these little U's, they're just the columns of U and little V's, those are the columns of V, okay? And then here's what the theorem says. It says that if you take these columns and just group them into sets in different ways, you get bases, orthonormal bases, in fact, because they're columns of unitary matrices, 
of whichever fundamental matrix subspace you want, okay? So if you take the first R, or the first rank A, columns of U, throw them in a set, you get an orthonormal basis of the range of A, okay? Whereas if you take the other columns of U, the leftover ones, right, all of the ones after the Rth column of U, well, now you get an orthonormal basis of null space of A star, okay? On the other hand, if you do the same thing with V, so if you take the first R columns of V, the first rank of A columns of V, then you're going to get an orthonormal basis of the range of A star now, okay? So range of A became range of A star now when we swapped which unitary matrix we were working with. And then instead, if you take the leftover columns of V, so, you know, the all, all of the columns of V after the rth one, then now you're going to get an orthonormal basis of the null space of A, okay? So if you just carefully choose which columns you're looking at from whichever unitary matrix, then you get an, an orthonormal basis of whichever fundamental matrix subspace you want. All right, let's see where this comes from, okay? And fortunately, the proof actually isn't too nasty. The hard part was getting the singular value decomposition. Now that we have it, though, all of these corollaries of it come very, very quickly. So let's see. In particular, we're going to prove parts A and D of this theorem, okay? We're going to prove parts A and D. Parts B and C are similarly. You can try on your own, okay? I'll give you a you know, rough guideline of how to do that. Okay? And the trick here is we're going to compute A times Vj. And sort of the idea of why we would want to do this is we know that we in, in the singular value decomposition, decomposition of A, we've got this V star over on the right here. So this product here, it's going to simplify down similar to how it simplified down, you know, up on the previous page. We just did this trick. Okay. If I do A times Vj, well, that's U sigma V star times Vj. I just plugged in the singular value decomposition there. And this V star times Vj, that just becomes Ej, the jth standard basis vector, the vector with zeros everywhere except a one in the jth entry, using the exact same trick that we talked about up above when we had E3 pop up in a calculation. Okay, and now we've got diagonal matrix times the standard basis vector. That just becomes sigma j times Ej, right? I mean, Ej is an eigenvector of a diagonal matrix with the corresponding diagonal entry as its eigenvalue. So it's just the same as a scalar multiplication there. Okay, and then one more matrix multiplication trick. Here we've got U times EJ. Well, if you ever have a matrix times a standard basis vector, that just picks off the corresponding column of the matrix. U times EJ, well, that's just the jth column of U. Well, we already gave a name to that. That's U sub J. Okay, so if you do this entire calculation, you find that A times VJ is sigma J times UJ. Okay, so A times the jth column of V is the jth singular value times the jth column of U. Okay, now we're going to split into two cases because this tells us something different depending on whether the singular value here is zero or not. Okay, so case one, what happens if that singular value is not zero? Well, this time it's going to tell us something about the range because if that singular value is not zero, we can divide this entire equation through by it and we're going to find that A times, well, just one over sigma times Vj equals Uj, right? That's just this equation up here with both sides divided by sigma J. In other words, A times something equals UJ, okay? If you, have, if you have A times something if equals UJ, that means that UJ has got to be in the range of A, right? A times some vector equals UJ, okay, well, that means UJ is a valid output of this matrix or linear transformation. It's something that I can get to via this matrix or linear transformation. So it's in the range of that matrix, okay? But furthermore, okay, we're assuming that the matrix has rank R, Okay, in other words, the dimension of its range is R, right? That's the definition of rank. Rank is the dimension of the range. Okay, so the dimension of the range is R, and we just showed that the first R columns of U are all in the range, right? That's what we showed up, up here. If sigma J is not equal to zero, well, yeah, the first R sigma J's are not equal to zero. Okay, so each of these vectors are in that range. Well, this is an orthonormal subset of the range then, right? These are all orthogonal to each other. They all have length one. And whenever that happens, right, we have a theorem that says, you know, if you've got a mutually orthogonal set uh, of R vectors living in an R dimensional vector space, then it's a basis of that vector space. So we can conclude right away that this set here, it's an orthonormal basis of the range of A. And that's exactly what we wanted. That is property A of this theorem. That is this. We just proved it. Okay. On the other hand, so that's what we get if sigma j is not equal to zero. On the other hand, if sigma j equals zero, okay, then what happens? Then a times v equals zero. Where, well, where did this come from? This just comes from, again, this first equation. We compute a times vj equals sigma j times uj. 
Okay, but we're now we're assuming that sigma j equals zero. So this right hand side is just the zero vector. So that's all that happened. Okay, so a times bj equals the zero vector. In other words, v is in the null space of a, right? That's exactly what the null space means. It's a set of vectors that get mapped to the zero vector. So bj is in the null space of a. And now it's just a very similar argument to what we did up above. Now we just do a dimension counting sort of thing. What is the dimension of the null space? Well, we know from the rank nullity theorem, this was the theorem from the previous course, the dimension of the range of a matrix plus the dimension of its null space, those add up to however many columns the matrix has. Okay, in other words, the rank of a matrix plus the nullity of a matrix equals you know, n, the number of columns. So if we're assuming that this matrix has rank r, then the null space has to have dimension n minus r. In other words, the nullity is n minus r. Okay, and well, here is a collection of n minus r vectors. They're all orthogonal to each other because again, they're columns of a unitary matrix and they're all unit vectors. So we can conclude right away because they're all orthogonal and there's the right number of them, yeah. It's an orthonormal basis of the null space. And that's exactly what we wanted for part D. This conclusion here is exactly part D of the theorem. Okay, so that's what we proved now. Okay, so we proved parts A and D, and parts B and C, they're very, very similar. It's the same calculation. You just do all of these calculations with A star times columns of U instead, instead of A times columns of V. Okay, so you can try that on your own if you want. Okay, but it's the same procedure. All right, so that's our big beast of a theorem for today's class. And there's one really quick and really nice corollary of this. We're not actually even going to do a formal proof of this. It just follows almost immediately. Let's look at uh, this really carefully. Let's look at properties A and B together, and let's look at properties C and D together, okay? Because these actually, if you, if you look at them sort of grouped like this, you can learn something really important about a matrix. Here we have columns from a unitary matrix, and here we have other columns from a unitary matrix, the same unitary matrix, right? Okay, each of the columns in this set is are orthogonal to the columns in this set. Okay, so in particular, if you take any linear combination of these guys, you're going to get something that's orthogonal to any linear combination of these guys. So what that tells you is anything in the range of A is going to be orthogonal to anything in the null space of A star. And that's what our, the first half of our corollary is going to be. Okay, this corollary says if you've got any matrix, well, then we say range of A is orthogonal to the null space of A star. And what that means is that if you pick any vector in here and any vector in here, yeah, they're going to be orthogonal to each other. Okay. Similarly, for the other two fundamental sub subspaces, right? If we focus on properties C and D now, again, this set, these are columns from the unitary matrix V. And this set, these are other columns from the unitary matrix V. Okay. Because it's a unitary matrix, all of its columns are orthogonal to each other. So every linear combination of these guys is orthogonal to every linear combination of these guys. So everything in range of A star is orthogonal to everything in null space of A. Okay. So we say that the null space of A is orthogonal to the range of A star. And again, what that means, what we mean by subspaces being orthogonal to each other is we mean that every vector in one of those subspaces is orthogonal to every vector in the other space, okay? So everything in the range of A is orthogonal to everything in the null space of A star, and everything in the range of A star is orthogonal to everything in the null space of A. Okay, so again, that gives you sort of a nice geometric way of thinking about these fundamental matrix subspaces. Okay, so let's do an actual computational example to try to sort of pin this all down in our head, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to work with this matrix here. We're going to construct a singular value decomposition of it, and we're going to use that singular value decomposition to construct orthonormal bases of all of the four fundamental subspaces of A. And actually, maybe before I do this example, I will note, I will remind you that we learned in the previous course how to find bases of the four fundamental subspaces. So in a sense, this is nothing new. Okay, we already knew how to find bases of these four fundamental subspaces. And if we wanted to, we could just apply Gram-Schmidt to those bases that we find, and we would get an orthonormal basis of each of the fundamental subspaces. The point of it doing it this way, though, is it just gives us one method of all finding all four bases at once, and furthermore, they're just automatically orthonormal. We don't have to do this extra step of applying Gram-Schmidt. And furthermore, the singular value decomposition, it's a, useful for a lot more than just this. So oftentimes what it's really good to do, it's just, you've got a matrix and you want to do some stuff with it. Well, just you start off, you find the singular value decomposition, 
And then everything else becomes really easy. If after the fact you want to find orthonormal bases of the fundamental subspaces, you can do it just by looking at things. You don't have to calculate anymore. And there's lots of other nice stuff that you can do as well. In a sense, doing a singular value decomposition, it unlocks the matrix and makes every calculation you want to do with it very, very easy. All right, so let's use this method to find orthonormal bases of the four fundamental subspaces. All right, so step one, do eigenstuff for either A star A or A A star. Okay, so here I've opted to use A A star, and the reason for this is just that this is a three by three matrix, right? A A star is three by three, whereas if I worked with A star A, it would be a four by four matrix. So it would just make the calculations a little bit harder to do. So I'm gonna do the three by three one instead. Okay. Again, I'm going to skip over the eigen, eigen stuff calculations here. You know how to do these, okay? Eigenvalues of this matrix, they're 6, 4, and 0, okay? And corresponding eigenvectors are 1, 1, 1, corresponding to 6, and 1, 0, minus 1, corresponding to 4, and 1, minus 2, 1, corresponding to 0. Those are corresponding eigenvectors for those eigenvalues. Okay, so next up, we're going to construct sigma out of the eigenvalues we just computed, and we're going to construct one of the unitary matrices out of the eigenvectors that we just computed. Okay, so sigma, now here, here we want to be a little bit careful. This might be one of our first uh, non-square examples that we've gone through. You want sigma, it always has the same size as A itself. So here, A is, is 3 by 4, so sigma has got to be 3 by 4 as well. It's really tempting to make diagonal matrices just square all the time, but that's not what ha what's happening in the singular value decomposition, right? Sigma always has the exact same size as A itself, so it's got to be 3 by 4 here. And then what are its diagonal entries? Well, just the square roots of the singular values, so square root 6, Great. Square root 4, well that's 2, and then square root 0 is just 0. So those are my diagonal entries, and then I'm done. All right, so that's sigma. Now I construct one of the unitary matrices, and here I'm going to do something that's going to throw you a little bit. I construct the unitary matrix U here, not V. In the previous examples, we constructed V out of these eigenvectors. And the reason that it's different is I'm using A A star in this calculation, not A star A. If I constructed eigenvectors of A star A, I would construct V. But here, I computed eigenvectors of A, A star. That gets me U instead, so I have to be a little bit careful. U is the unitary matrix that has these guys as its columns, but normalized. Okay, so 1, 1, 1 becomes 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3. 1, 0, minus 1 becomes, well, same thing over root 2. And this third eigenvector becomes the same thing, but over root 6. Okay, so, but that's U, not V. And you can make sure that this makes sense just by double-checking the dimensions in the singular value decomposition. Because this is a 3 by 4 matrix, the left unitary is going to be 3 by 3. The right unitary actually has to be 4 by 4. So if you throw these columns into V, you're going to find your matrix multiplications don't even make sense at the end of the calculation. All right, so be a little careful here. When you use A, A star, you're, using the, the you're constructing the unitary matrix U, not V. All right, so the last step then, we've got sigma, we've got U, we've got two pieces of our SVD. We need the third piece. We need V, the unitary matrix V now. And the way you compute that, it's the same way that we normally compute U from V, okay? You do, okay, you do the matrix times the columns of the first unitary that you already did divided by the singular value. So this is very much what we did before with one extra wrinkle here. Here, again, one extra change that you have to make because we're using A, A star instead of A star A, you have to use a star in this formula, right? Normally, we would say like u1 equals 1 over sigma 1 a times v1, okay? Here, it's got to be a star, and the reason for that, again, is just because we're using a a star instead of a star a, okay? So, in, in a sense, you can think of this, whenever you use a a star to construct an SVD instead of a star a, you just have to sort of swap the roles of a and a star everywhere, and similarly swap the roles of u and v everywhere. If you don't do those two things, then everything will work out fine. Okay, so we've got to use a star instead of a here. All right, but now it's just a matrix vector multiplication. So you just plop in a star, there it is, it's the conjugate transpose of the matrix A that we had up above. One over root six, well that's just because sigma one is root six. Okay, and here is u one, it's the first column of u. And you just do that matrix vector multiplication, you end up getting 1 over root 2 times 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay? So that's our first column of V, the first column of the unitary matrix V. Second column, you do the same thing, you just increase all the subscripts to 2s now. Okay? And you just plop everything in. Here's A, um, and 1 over sigma 2, right? Sigma 2 is 2, so it's 1 half here. And then here's the second column of U, just got plopped in there. 
Okay, and you do that matrix vector multiplication. This time you get one over root two times one zero zero minus one. And one thing to note before we go forward, again, these two vectors here, they both have length one. And again, that better happen or something's gone haywire. Okay, if if you get something that doesn't have length one, then it can't be a column of a unitary matrix. So something's gone haywire. These have got to be columns of the unitary matrix V. All right, so that does it for non-zero singular values. We found the first two columns of V via the non-zero singular values, but then the only other singular values, sigma three was zero. Okay, so the remaining columns of V don't matter. They can be whatever you want them to be as long as the matrix is still unitary. Okay, so as long as those two extra columns that we have to construct, they've gotta be orthogonal to these two columns that we just constructed, these two columns here, and they've also gotta have length one. Okay, but you can construct them however you like. And in this particular case, because they're, these vectors are so nice, we can construct them just by eyeballing, right? If we want two columns that are orthogonal to these guys, well, I can construct something that's orthogonal to this one just by doing zero, one, and then minus one, zero. And similarly, I can construct something that's orthogonal to this one just by doing one, zero, zero, one. And because of the zero, non-zero pattern of these vectors, then all the orthogonality uh, restrictions will work out, okay? So just by inspection, here are two more unit vectors that are orthogonal to each other and or are orthogonal to V1 and V2 that I already computed, okay? If you're not able to see those by inspection, like if you're not able to just say, oh yeah, here's another vector that's orthogonal to the ones I already have, well, another way that you could go is you could construct these via Gram the Gram-Schmidt process, okay? All right. Um, right, so now we've got a full singular value decomposition. We know what u is, we know what sigma is, we know what v is, so now we can construct the orthonormal bases of our four fundamental subspaces. So for the range, what you do, well, it's a matrix with rank two, right? There are two non-zero singular values, so I take the first two columns of u. I take u1 and u2, which, well, here they are. I just copied them down from the previous page. That's my first two columns of u. The next subspace was null space of A star, and it's just all of the remaining columns of U. So in this case, while there's only a third column of U, U was a three by three matrix. So here's the third column of U, great. That's an orthonormal basis of the null space of A star, okay? Now we go to part C of that theorem, orthonormal basis of the range of A star. Well, range of A star is also two dimensional, right? Remember, we have a theorem from the previous class that says that the rank of A is always the same as the rank of A star. So these two subspaces, range and range, Range of A and range of A star, they have the same dimension. So we also need two vectors here. It's a two dimensional subspace, all right? But this time we go to the matrix V, okay? We take its first two columns instead, and here they are. I just copy, I copied them down. Those are V1 and V2 from the previous page. And then final uh, fundamental subspace is null space of A. And what you, how you get that is you just take the leftover columns from V. So it's gonna be V3 and V4 in this case, which we wrote down up here. And well, there they are. So you take those guys, put them in a set. That's an orthonormal basis of the null space of A. Alrighty, so that'll do it for today. I will see you guys soon for lecture 37 uh, when we'll talk about how the singular value decomposition relates to other matrix decompositions that we've seen.